Good afternoon. I'm going to just get right into it. I, I, um, I've done a number of these presentations. This project um, dates from uh, 2004, actually, an international design competition won by uh, Antoine Predock of Albuquerque, New Mexico. Smith Carter is the architects of record. Uh, we've been involved since the beginning of schematic design on the project all the way through. I've been on the project for about eight years. Um, today, we're, I'll talk about a little bit about uh, an introduction to the team and the project, um, a bit about the architectural inspiration in the site. I'm going to try and move fairly quickly through that stuff. Some of the challenges that we faced um, and how we, how we sort of uh, develop the, the modeling and the design. Because this project goes back so many years, a lot of the, the BIM strategies that we had, uh, we were working with, for instance, we were working with Revit. Um, Revit had just introduced, uh, I believe, uh, electrical to it. Uh, mechanical wasn't all that old either. Um, so we, we had mechanical, electrical, and structural all, all on uh, one Revit platform, but um, you know, we were struggling with some, some early versions of, of some software, uh, and I'm sure there are some other um, versions of and techniques that are out there which are uh, more advanced that we might, might use, but we're, I'm going to show you what we did in, in any case. Um, we used uh, um, BIM really as a, as a great coordination tool. We used it all the way into construction. PCL, uh, as a construction manager, used the project um, use the model uh, in order to do their concrete formwork. Uh, a variety of the, the uh, components were, were done directly from the, the model, uh, the steel in particular. Um, I'll show you that though. We showed it, show you how we used it in, in bidding and some of the things that we did uh, to try and get bidders to understand the project. Um, and we, we really wanted to build the, uh, the building entirely from the model, uh, which we did with varying levels of success. So I'll show you some of that as well. This was a team, uh, a lar very large team. Um, the engineers were primarily out of Toronto. Um, Hulk or Yalis, or Yalis as, as they're known now, was a structural engineer, Mitchell Partnership, Mechanical, and Mulvey Benani, Electrical. There were about 40 firms in total that, that contributed to the design of this project, though. So this is a, a, just a small snapshot of the number of, of uh, specialty firms that, that were involved. Um, our offices were delivering this thing from uh, Smith Carter's office in Winnipeg, and we had support in a variety of different locations. Uh, we had uh, BIM contributing it from a variety of locations around the world, not just in North America as well. So, so we uh, we were managing a very complicated project and a very very uh, um, web-enabled kind of uh, project. Um, Talk a little bit about the building. I'm not, I, I know that you, uh, a number of you, have visited the building. It has a number of complex components to it, all of which have a, a kind of special meaning in the architecture of it. The four roots, uh, cast in place concrete, um, the garden, the mountain galleries, which are basically a steel uh, construction, the Hall of Hope ramps, which uh, I, you probably didn't see much of, but they're an alabaster-clad steel structure. Uh, the cloud structure, the wings, the Tower of Hope, all of these pieces were kind of named parts, and uh, each one is a sort of like a, a, an architectural project in itself. As I said, it was an international design competition. These are the boards that we were originally presented with, four boards and not a lot else, so this was what we had to start with. Um, not very uh, specific, very fuzzy kind of things, and we had to kind of work out everything with, uh, with Antoine's office through the course of the project. Some of the images that, uh, that were inspiring, uh, I'm not gonna talk a little bit about, but uh, you probably heard a little bit about them um, on your trip today. Um, the site of the forks, of course, is very important in, in Winnipeg history and in the history of, uh, of Manitoba as a meeting place for Aboriginal peoples for um, the last 6,000 years. It had an archeological zone so we had, uh, had some interesting issues to deal with on site. Um, some of the geometry challenges, the, the structural engineer was asked to, to do this structure of the cloud that, that looked uh, somewhat like a, a tree root, a very organic kind of structure, deliberately complicated in, in appearance. Um, 
the, the mountain galleries uh, were conceived really as a series of stone boxes and they, the it, structural engineer developed them using these uh, super height uh, trusses which were then stacked one on top of another in these, these kind of box format to eliminate, eliminate most of the columns that, that would have resulted. You can see that yellow form, for instance, has an enormous cantilever. Um, so there's, there's some real structural gymnastics going on there. Um, struggling with the idea of a building that was so geometric, all the, slo the, the walls sloping, uh, where do you take as a reference point even to draw a plan? How do you put a grid to it? Um, so we developed through a, a series of sketches and came up with an idea of having a, a structural zone rather than a structural grid. And we wound up using uh, all of our floor plans at one millimeter above the floor because anywhere else would give a real uh, wrong impression about where things were to be located. Um, we used a variety of different, had to integrate a variety of different uh, techniques or, or um, platforms. Um, Antoine's office used Form Z. We had to use Rhino at, at times. Yalis used a lot of Katia, and then they translated it into, into Revit. Um, and we, we could bring all of that into Revit, and uh, we also used Navisworks as, a, as an integrator as well. So here you see, you see that piece, that, that concrete opening that was, uh, was originally developed in Form Z, and finally it, it sort of appears as a, as a real thing. These curved roots are a real challenge because the walls are sloping, they're curving, and they're, ri they're um, rising in elevation. And uh, they're out of concrete on top of that. So uh, coming up with strategies of concrete formwork and how to, how to put the thing together. Um, at the time, uh, these kind of curved shapes weren't supported very well by Revit. Uh, they were done in Katia and brought, brought into Revit. Um, trying, to, trying to think about how, how does the structure actually work. And, and uh, this is, uh, again, just sort of talking about, about the uh, um, roots, but each of, the, each of the main kind of structural components of the building was sort of imagined as, as more simple forms, uh, shapes of cones and so on, that, that uh, were then sort of uh, translated into, into uh, lines of bearing and structure. Um, this cloud form was done by Joseph Gardner out of uh, Germany. Um, it was originally f done in, in uh, Form Z uh, through Antoine's office and working back and forth with, with Joseph Gardner, we had to come up with a shape that would allow us to have glass that wasn't uh, curved. None of the glass sections are curved, they're all, all flat. Uh, it's possible to do cold bending with glass to, to start to actually bend the glass without casting it curved. Uh, we decided we weren't going to do that because we were worried about all the tension that that would put in it. So we had a whole series of exercises where we were going back and forth trying to optimize the volume and as well as the, the overall sort of surface material and make sure that we were still consistent with the architectural vision. Um, and those were going back and forth through MotoCAD 3D uh, and Form Z primarily. And then the final result was brought into Revit. Um, the main structure of that is a, is a kind of series of, of pipes that, are, that have these Virendil trusses hung from them. So there's these ring beams that have a, a top and bottom ring beam and a, a Virendil truss slung between them. Um, again, modeled in AutoCAD 3D. Um, this just kind of shows how the, the glass is constructed. Uh, those of you who saw it, it's a fritted glass. Uh, there is no actual steel in the, in the glass. The, the uh, glass is put together by taking the spacer of the glass, which holds the gla pieces of glass together, offsetting it to create a, a, a gap or a slot. And there's a steel toggle that goes in the slot and tied back to the, the, the main Virendil truss. So um, then the whole thing is silicone together. So there's very little thermal bridging that happens. It's, it's actually energy quite energy efficient for a double glaze system. Um, again, here's the, the uh, cloud and how uh, Hulkor um, trans translated it from Katia back to AutoCAD. So the 
cloud is really two parts. It's a, got an upper and a lower tower, five shards coming down into sh six shards. And they imagined it as, as two uh, inter intertwined cones and then applied the pieces to them so that um, the structural loads could be analyzed properly and, and to give it some kind of structural logic. We wind up with this very sort of uh, um, unusual shattered kind of look. What Antoine wanted was the whole building to kind of dissolve into the air and was using these um, analogies of, of uh, snow and ice. Um, and so um, the building, uh, in reality, in the final reality, the, the top portion is actually clear, <coughs> clear glass, uh, which gives it a more kind of dissolving kind of quality to it. Again, all the pieces of the structure uh, were, were done um, fully, fully in, uh, uh, in, a, in a BIM mode. Uh, this just sort of kind of gives a, it's, it's quite simplistic, but you know, we, we obviously had to break the thing down into component by component to try and um, create a series of models within the model. Um, showing that we've got um, various consultants working on various pieces simultaneously and us managing the process to try and keep all of the parts uh, pulling together at the same time. Um, we, we used uh, the Revit model quite extensively and, and uh, Navisworks models quite extensively just to study the, the components and, and uh, for, for uh, design development. Uh, this tower was a, was a, uh, an amazingly complicated piece. Um, there are code issues with it because it's a, got a single exit. There are uh, just structural issues of supporting it. The tower itself actually sits on the cloud structure, and there's a there's a pair of uh, of um, uh, elevator cores that, that rise through the the cloud. One of the elevator uh, pieces goes all the way up to the, the uh, observation platform. I'm just going to go back for a second, just finish that thought. So it goes up to the observation platform, but the, the, the main superstructure of the tower is actually supported on all of those trusses that support the cloud and not on the, the uh, elevator truss itself. So just a, a lot of complexity. And then there's a whole question of how do you wash the glass and developing uh, a way to get up the tower and then to, to come back, we actually worked out how a guy would work on a bosun chair um, and developed uh, transition platforms and uh, all of that in, in a, uh, a Revit kind of mode. We used, um, uh, at Ralph Applebaum, the exhibit designer, used SketchUp and then we brought that back into Revit uh, this is uh, the, what they call the Canadian Gallery. I'm, I'm not sure that you got into that uh, space, but there's a series of uh, niches below a, a kind of a two-story structure and uh, in a very tall space. <coughs> there's a space there. Um, all the steel framing was done in, uh, was done in Revit. Uh, we've got these alabaster ramps flying through. We've got mechanical systems. Just the, the sheer geometric complexity of it would be very, very difficult to have have done in any other way. And, and uh, it's actually a very tight coordination of, of the steel and, and uh, uh, you know, tolerances to the openings. Uh, it, all, it all works out though, it's, it's, uh, it's terrific. Um, a, lot of this, a lot of the modeling was led by uh, Halker Yalis who were quite advanced at the time. This is our first Revit project. Uh, we really bit a, bit a lot uh, in uh, in t taking on Revit, um, I worked in uh, 3D modeling various various platforms for 25 years, but um, Revit was certainly new for us at the time. Um, so Yalis did a lot of their work in Katia. Uh, they used their SAP 2000 as well to some structural uh, analysis software. That was, that was brought into Revit, um, mechanical, electrical as well all in Revit, and uh, then, we, then PCL took on the model as well and, and uh, contributed it, and contributed to the, uh, the coordination. Uh, a number of the fabricators, the steel I mentioned, Gardner um, was out of the model. Uh, all the concrete formwork was out, out of the model. 
mechanical engine or mechanical contract, Dirksen, uh, really took a, a great lead in, in using the model um, in uh, working out piping, working out ductwork, threading it through the steel. This is just sh kind of showing how, how the, uh, the various kind of components were, were built up. Um, one of the other interesting things that, that PCL was able to do with the, with the model was to use it for their scheduling and for um, delivery, uh, um, delivery of uh, uh, the project, really. Uh, Walters, the steel fabricator, um, used it to um, analyze how they would fabricate their sequences and, and how they would erect it, and, you know, the, the placement of the crane and, and what piece went on top of the next and so on was all, all done uh, using a series of, of model views. So being able to cut all these sections, uh, follow the systems through the building, um, isolate elements. We, we spent a lot of time on, uh, on WebExes, uh, on, on conference calls. We had a lot of face-to-face -face communication because a project like this, you, you actually have to meet a fair amount too. A lot of decisions that have to be made with the owner. But uh, we spent a lot of time looking at individual components and isolating uh, parts and, and just working them out interactively on, on the spot um, and coming up with agreement on how to proceed on things. And it, it was, as I said, it was very complicated because we had a, a design architect in Albuquerque uh, we had people working uh, for us in Chicago, in Calgary, in Ottawa, and in Winnipeg, um, architecturally. Uh, we had um, all of our engineers in various places, uh, and everybody had a, had a uh, you know, their, their input on a lot of these things because they were just so I integrated. You didn't get to see the Hall of Hope ramps. Um, the gallery is navigated by means of ramps. You go up a total of 58 meters vertically, and you go entirely by ramps. So um, there's about 800 um, meters of ramp. We have, they're all at, it was, the building was designed at one in 10. And of course, that doesn't meet our codes. And we have to have ramp interval, intervals of uh, every nine meters, we have to have a, f a flat area. So the amount of ramp that was in the original design that we were given went up by at least 25%, maybe 30%. And so these ramps that switch back between galleries back and forth uh, through this great hall of hope, this huge canyon space, um, goes up 185 feet. These ramps were really just supposed to originally just connect the dots. Well, they wound up poking into galleries and we had to figure out ways of circulating back and forth inside that, that uh, hall of hope to try and get them reconnected uh, and arriving at the right spots in the galleries. And on top of that, they're so long that you have travel distance to an exit that you have to deal with. And so we had to find openings into uh, a core there at various intervals to get, uh, get people off the ramps. Really, really complicated. Um, the ramps are uh, structural steel. They're clad in alabaster. Alabaster is, uh, is a very uh, translucent stone, very soft. Uh, it's internally illuminated with LEDs. This was worked out the, through um, Pico Engineering, who were working for, uh, for um, the, uh, the stone contractor. Um, they worked out all the connection details and so on in Inventor and uh, presented us with little components and pieces to look at in, uh, in Autodesk Design Review. These are the shop drawings that they, they produce. They're beautiful shop drawings, really, uh, done in an inventor. Um, here's the space that we, the Hall of Hope, with the, the ramps sort of starting to push through. I mean, a, a huge technical challenge just to build this stuff. It's, it's, it's unbelievable. And then the ramps, ultimately, uh, here they are. They internally illuminated. The whole idea is to have this glowing uh, path of light. But it, this took us a year. It took one guy an entire year working back and forth on this stuff because um, we, we had gone through a, a process of, of uh, sizing all the openings and, and locating all the openings. And the structural engineer told us the, 
the uh, concrete walls that were back, were going back and forth through uh, wouldn't stand up because there's no concrete left. So then we had to rework out all the openings that the, the concrete had to stand for uh, virtually freestanding um, during, during construction um, because the steel came later, the concrete went up, up first. So these things peppered with holes, uh, real, a real, like I said, a real challenge for, to build, but uh, just coordinating that was, was an, a huge, huge job and it took a long, long time and, and uh, entirely impossible without the use of a, of a BIM model. Uh, Navisworks was the, the tool that we used primarily to coordinate. Uh, we issued a, a Navisworks model, gee, I think probably every week through a, a good part of the project. Uh, we issued it to all the team members and downloaded it from our website. Um, and it would integrate all of the changes that had been made at that point. So, I mean, it, it, the great thing about Navisworks that you, you probably know is that you can integrate a great many of, uh, programs into it. It'll take uh, Revit and AutoCAD 3D, and it'll take Rhino, and it'll take even Form Z in a form. So we can pull all these various pieces together uh, and look at them uh, simultaneously, and, and um, various contributors can, can add their piece without us having to attach a lot of smart information to it. It's, very, it's a kind of dumbed down version, but uh, very effective for, for looking at the impacts of, of uh, various systems. One of the other things we did, because we wanted the builders to build from the model, was we had, uh, we have a, had a construction environment where building from models, in, certainly in Winnipeg, was, was pretty new territory. And uh, we, we wanted the, this is the f one of the first packages that went out uh, for masonry. We wanted to um, make sure that they understood what the project was. And what we did was identified uh, all the masonry in the building, we were able to extract it from Revit. We gave them uh, CDs of DW DWXF models, so just kind of stripped down models that they could look at their components and query them. Uh, we also gave them sheets of drawings that showed every, sa every surface uh, that they had to build, and we did the, their area takeoffs for them. So every sheet had an area su summary, um, and by doing that, we wound up getting four bids on the masonry. Uh, I've forgotten what the value of the masonry contract was, but the, the, the uh, variance was with one, one to two percent between the bidders, which on a, a level of complexity of this project is, is really amazing. Um, PCL used the, the model for their um, formwork, DOCA formwork. Uh, these are just some of the shop drawings that were produced. And some of the formwork, because of these sloping walls, uh, the, again, a, an enormous challenge putting up uh, walls that are, are sloping uh, in concrete that are your primary structure. Uh, oh, here's the... Uh, the drawing from Walters on, on uh, their scheduling. And so they, they produced a series of drawings. I, I've got, a, got them somewhere. I uh, could cycle through them if you're interested. But they, they did kind of show the building being constructed kind of virtually. And you see the cranes moving around and the pieces being added. And they finish, it, finish all the steel that way. Um, and the steel is, was very you know, kind of aggressive steel. I, you look at this diagram here. The, the top little diagram, you can see the little shadow figure, the kind of scale that we're talking about, the very, very big pieces. Um, in fact, Walters, the, the steel fabricator, was, was so, um, uh, I mean, they, they, they did a terrific job. They were, te uh, their role was to, one of their roles was to design all the connections and uh, coming up with, with uh, the, you know, these connections that, that are, so complicated, they actually gave them names. They would spend like two, three weeks working on a single connector um, and, uh, and, and modeling it, putting it in the model. All the steel uh, came directly from the, the structural um, engineer's um, design software and <coughs> downloaded directly the, the orders to the mills and so on. And Walters is all, is all fully uh, um, BIM enabled, so they're, you know, their uh, cutting machinery is all 
uh, laser laser driven by by the uh, the model. Um, really, really quite amazing uh, uh, the way that the, the thing goes up. What we were able to do was to take Walter's fabrication model and and Hulker Yall's steel model and, and overlay them and be able to see where where things were buried. Primarily, it was in the in the uh, in the connections. Of course, one of the one of the challenges is this is a fast track project on top of everything else, so it, mean, it means that you have to make these hard and fast decisions really early, um, which really helped a lot having a, having the the uh, computer models, of course. But uh, sometimes you have to live with the consequences, and you don't know what the uh, the final d design direction is going to be. So we were able to uh, resolve some building envelope issues. Um, w by using the model and, and uh, looking at how um, some of the connections were starting to Im impact on the building envelope. Uh, one, of the, uh, one of the things that, just to, to show you some getting down into some detail about, about how we uh, use this thing in, in construction, the piping and fin system, there's a hydronic system, uh, heating system in the building um, on top of some of the ring beams in the cloud area. Um, the mechanical engineer, I think, only showed them in 2D. It was pretty complicated to, to model, and I don't think they, they did that. Uh, but the uh, mechanical contractor, Dirksen, did model it in, in Revit. And so the challenge here was to follow the segmented ring, uh, ring beam and, and get a kind of integrated look. And, and this is the final result. It was really fabulous. If you look, it's really hard to see on the screen because the screen's kind of ripply, but that ring beam is a series of straight sections and it changes direction periodically and to try and follow that and to fabricate all of your, all of your uh, sections is uh, a, a geometrical challenge. They, they did a, a series of mock-ups um, and, and tested various things. We, we were kind of picky about what we wanted to see too. We didn't want to see, uh, we didn't want to see um, a bunch of piping. We didn't, you know, we wanted to have a, a kind of sleep a sleek, clean look. In fact, Antoine's office didn't want that at all, but uh, we man managed to um, develop a system that was was uh, pretty pretty clean looking. Um, but the pipe joints had to accommodate all these geometric transitions, and there's these gigantic hubs that the that the uh, ring beams come together on, which we had to dodge. Um, the fin cores were hidden from below with a with a mesh put on only one side because we realized that you couldn't see it from the other side. Uh, these offsets in the cabinets wound up with a, with a, a little seam cover. So it, you know, it, in the end, it, it, was, uh, it was put together. You don't even see it in the end. Uh, really, really, uh, you, it's, you, can see, you can see it, of course, if you look on that heavy, uh, the heavy lines of the, the ring beams that cut across the center there. But gee, I mean, what a beautiful uh, integration. Uh, another thing, <coughs> just to show, uh, the, the uh, cloud also has a linear bar grill that runs around the perimeter uh, against the glass. There's a, a kind of a grill. Here, here you see the grill, and you see the bar grill, and then the carpet immediately adjacent to it. You can see the difficulty of, the, if you look at the, the outer grill yeah. there, um, that was all done really not CAD enabled. We tried, but there are just so many weird circumstances there. A lot of it was um, templated in plywood. And the funny thing is that the bar grill, I mean, despite all these things, the bar grill actually that, that was done through EH e e Price came out really, really well. Uh, you know, if you've ever done molding, woodwork molding and tried to, to get a 45 degree joint to, to mate properly. You know how difficult it is to get these things to go smoothly. And every section had a little different angle here, a little different angle there, and they put these things all together. Uh, that was all done through the, the BIM software. And it went together really well on site. I mean, the, the joints are really tight, way better than the, than the uh, grill work against the glass. So just uh, just a kind of a review of some of the advantages. I, um, some of these are, are um, old hat to some people, um, but it allowed us to connect some geographically dispersed 
very geographically dispersed teams uh, to share ideas really quickly and give the owner in particular a better understanding of what it was they were getting and what, what, where we're going with it and what the, what the sort of material quality of the building was. Um, gave an early inter understanding of some of the design challenges and better conceptualization of some of the engineering solutions. And the, you know, the technical solutions in this project are, are enormous as well. It, the, 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 uh, you know, having these sloped walls with masonry on them and, and sloped concrete and so on, building envelope issues, the, the cloud, the gutters, the, you know, all of the various roofing issues, the green roofs, the, it goes on and on and on. Um, but uh, the model certainly helped us in, in solving a lot of those things. Some of the things, though, that we, we kind of learned uh, on the thing, it really, it's important to try and keep the highest level of skill available on the project. Uh, staffing with juniors is really, really difficult, um, and modelers need to be ideally technically skilled, both in their, in their discipline as well as in modeling. Um, just throwing junior people at it who don't really understand how a building goes together is, especially on a fast track project of this kind of complexity, a real, a real problem. Um, and it really helps if the, the uh, interdisciplinary members of teams, um, the mechanical engineer, the structural engineer, uh, the electrical engineer, the architect are all sort of uh, more senior, like I said, uh, who, on a common understanding uh, about how their discipline really works. Um, the other thing that we, we found was doing sketches beforehand, of course, I mean, you've got to know what you're going to model before you model it. Um, and it, it's very easy to just kind of wade into things. Uh, a lot of the, the design information that we were getting in Form Z was, you know, it was what was already modeled. So it's a kind of tempting just to sort of follow that. But you really have to rethink everything before you put it to, uh, into, into the model. Um, we did learn that uh, we would try and, try and minimize the reliance on overly high level BIM systems um, to work on a common platform where possible and Nav Navisworks was certainly a, a great one. Uh, Revit, Revit worked out really well for us, I think, uh, on this one. But uh, as I said, Navisworks was, was a thing that everybody relied on, certainly through construction. Um, you can just quickly get a, get a view of a, a condition. You can turn on and off elements to strip it down to see what's behind it or what the coordinating issues could be. Um, so it really helped us uh, to find some shortcuts, and it's very easy sort of uh, interface for, for non-users. Um, and of course, using PDFs was invaluable as well. And breaking the model into the, into the right number of components, of course, is always a huge issue. Uh, Trying to figure out what the right, right um, thing is right off the bat. Um, our, as I said, this building was fast-tracked. It had a number of parts each individually super complicated. So it was important that we try and, they, we treated them almost like, uh, like little uh, building projects in themselves. Um, and uh, something I always say is that, that not, to, uh, not to fall in love with the data, to make sure that you're focusing on the deliverable and don't let your team members uh, fall in love with building the model and forget that the only purpose of it is to, is to give people other, other information. So we didn't try and attach a lot of data to this particular project in terms of smart information. There was some, but not, not uh, a great deal of it. It wasn't intended to be used for uh, an FM kind of purpose. Um, we pushed it as far as we could with the, with the uh, tools we had at the time into, uh, into construction. And you know, it's, uh, I think it, it's a, a huge achievement for the, the uh, construction team to be able to, be able to uh, work with us on that because um, it was, I'm sure it was a real challenge. So thank you. If, if I have any questions, I'd be happy to take them. Yeah. Lots of great stuff. What, uh, what were the real challenges? What, what were the, you know, this didn't all come as a rosy come by our project. Um, what were the challenges the team faced uh, that uh, caused the grief and anxiety? A lot of schedule. schedule. Um, pressures. We had a lot of, uh, well, I mean, budget pressure, pressures, of course, too. But you know, schedule schedule was a real issue, um, and trying to bring the design along fast enough that you could put together uh, bid packages that were um, 
as complete as possible. Um, that, that was a real challenge. Um, the model, I think everyone liked the idea of the model. Uh, as we got into construction and started to get into some of the early days of, of bidding, um, there's a fair amount of, uh, not just nervousness, but, but, but reality kind of sunk in that you know, the construction trades in Winnipeg were not going to just love this thing up and, and dive into models that you know, they were going to need a fair amount of assistance. And so that created a, uh, a, a bit of tension early on about you know, how far to go with the model. I think PCL could probably talk a little bit better about that. But um, you know, certainly, certainly uh, you know, this, the kind of scheduling issues and, and trying to keep uh, the, the information as, as complete as possible is, was tough in the early days anyway. I, I noticed you showed a lot of diagrams three-dimensionally where you assisted contractors with, or the model assisted contractors with scheduling and sequence of work. And how did you navigate? I'm sure you got loads of requests for Smith Carter to do some of this. Whereas, how did you manage even just your your scope of work? <laughs> well, yeah, I mean the. We, we certainly had our hands full trying to get our work done and not weren't trying to take on any on the work. PCL had agreed from the, the outset that this would be a, a 3D project and um, it was really the only way to do it. So they had people that on staff uh, who learned Revit and managed to, they pulled out a lot of stuff. They had one guy who pulled out a ton of stuff off the model, was doing stuff daily, you know, I'm sure, sure most of his time was spent extracting stuff from the model and, and uh, putting it out for various subtrades. Mm. So they, you know, whether, whether it's getting dimensions. You see, w what we did with the, with the model was um, the model was used primarily for geometry and we, we used traditional uh, 2D for um, representation of the scope of work. A lot of stuff is in the model though, like a lot. And anytime you wanted to actually build it, you know, even if you could, even if we gave you the takeoffs and, and you had the spreadsheets, and which we did for a number of trades. We did it for drywall, uh, I think we did it for painting, we did it for um, masonry, certainly. Um, the number of packages were put together like that, w that way, but um, you know, when you actually go and build it, it's a totally different issue, because now you actually have to place it relative to something, and we don't necessarily give you all the dimensions. We, give, we gave certain coordinating dimensions, but they had to go to the model which they did. Not always happily, but <laughs> no, it, really, it really was, uh, you know, it was, a, it was a learning process for everybody and I think it uh, uh, was terrific uh, in the end. In communication section, in very end, I saw that you mentioned that you use, try to use at least, uh, free downloaded software. Yep. Uh, how can it be? You used Revit, you used AutoCAD, CATIA, and uh, you used free downloaded just on very end, or? No, all the way through, all how the way through. How can it be and why? Freedom is, a, first of all, the, the, uh, it strips out a lot of the intelligent information out of the model. It, it's a dumbed down version. And when you're looking at primarily visual things, if you're, that's all you need. The, the Revit model became extremely large and unwieldy. And uh, for everybody, you know, f to turn on all the components to see everything simultaneously uh, would take a lot of time just to, just to load up the model, just, to, just to, before you could even do anything. It, it would take a long time. Whereas a Navisworks one, um, same model, uh, less than a minute, the software is up and the model's in front of you. You know, whereas it might take 15 minutes for the for the Revit model, and then you got to manipulate it. So, uh, you know, we probably could have done things differently the way we, you know the way the model sort of uh, got bigger and bigger and bigger. But Navisworks gave us a great a great shortcut to to be able to look at things quickly, <coughs> and the fact that it's a free downloadable um, uh, viewing software meant that all of our partners, whether it was a a contractor who was new with the project or whatever, could download the software four or five commands, and that's all you need to know. And uh, so it's very easy to, to learn. So it, it just, uh, 
you know, we, we, all, we had to force people to, to use it a little bit at the beginning, but anybody who used it loved it. I guess just out of curiosity, did you find any of the contractors would use more than just freedom? My experience has been that usually the contractors will switch to simulate or manage to do more sectioning and things like that of the Navisworks model? Um, or did they all just use freedom? You know what, I, I'm, I can't really say, talk to what, how they did it. I know that uh, Revit was used uh, by some though. Simulate wasn't available. Yeah, we you know that we started in two thousand eight on this project. We did use full bone Navisworks for clash detection. It's, PCL used it a lot more than we did for clash detection, but uh, you know we, we set up the views and th so on and set up the model in, in the full blown version, and then um, you know the routine kind of use would be through Freedom. Okay. All right, thank you very much.